doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them again, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven him. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Now Thomas, one of the twelve called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails, and place my finger into the mark of the nails, and place my hands into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas, uh, Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands, and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. That's the word of the Lord. Let us pray. Breathe in this place, O Lord, by the power of your Holy Spirit to open our minds, unlock our hearts, and enliven our faith so that we may welcome the risen one through the word today. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, Arun Sawatra. Is the sound okay? Yeah. Okay, I wasn't sure. Uh, this is the second Sunday of Easter. Uh, it could be the case that in many churches today, uh, the Sunday after Easter is uh, a Sunday where we kind of take a break. You know, after all, Easter weekend was very busy. Uh, during the Easter festivities, there's many people, there's families that come and get together to celebrate. Uh, so the Sunday after Easter, maybe for a lot of churches, maybe it normally gets quiet. You know, activities become more like business as usual. Uh, but from the way the church calendar works, uh, there's actually a different expectation. Uh, the suffering, death, and resurrection of Christ it's very central to our Christian faith. Uh, the church calendar actually has seven weeks in the Easter season uh, before it is followed by uh, the Pentecost Sunday. Uh, so that means Easter Sunday is actually just the start of the Easter season. Uh, the season is made up of seven Sundays, which we call uh, Sundays of Easter. We don't call them Sundays after Easter. Uh, so in the seven weeks or in the 50 days or so, the Christian church, at least those of us who follow the liturgical service, uh, our, the purpose will be to reflect on what it means to be a community that lives because of the resurrection of Jesus. So we will look at what it means to embrace the good news of what God has done in Christ and what it means for us today. Um, as you remember, if, uh, if you were here last Sunday, we talked mostly about Peter, uh, John, and Mary, and their encounter with the empty tomb. Uh, we talked about how this empty tomb was evidence that Christ has risen. Uh, no one ever in the history of the world has ever found a decomposed body or remains 
uh, that they can identify to be Jesus. Uh, but an important evidence for Jesus' resurrection is not just the empty tomb, but an important evidence is also Jesus' resurrection appearances. In reality, for us to say that Jesus has resurrected from the dead, uh, two conditions need to be there. The empty tomb and the resurrection appearances. If you think about it, if we only have the empty tomb and no appearances of Jesus, then all we have is an unsolved mystery. Uh, it's a mystery that in a way would be similar to what happened to Flight 370 of Malaysian Airlines uh, last March 14 or 2014. Remember that flight? Uh, the plane just disappeared. Uh, the search even now is still going on. It's already considered the most expensive search in aviation history. Um, since nothing on the plane was ever found, uh, no parts, no people, uh, no black box, uh, nothing whatsoever, people then have many different thoughts as to what could have happened or what may have happened. Uh, some say the plane may have been hijacked. Uh, or it had cockpit fire and it fell off uh, into the ocean, or it may have been shot down. Uh, some even say maybe it went inside some sort of outer space black hole, um, or was abducted by aliens, uh, things of that nature. Uh, but as you can see, you know, it's quite a mystery uh, whatever happened to that flight. Um, not to make light of the people who died, but you know, I'm just saying it's, it's a mystery. Uh, in the same way, if all we have left is Jesus, uh, in terms of Jesus, if all we have left is just the empty tomb, then the whole thing is just one big unsolved mystery. Uh, but if you look at the flip side, if, if we don't have an empty tomb, if Jesus' body was still in the tomb, and then we have resurrection appearances, then we have another issue. Uh, you can say that the appearances then are just dreams or visions uh, of the disciples since they were obviously sad, they were grieving that Jesus died. Uh, so if the tomb had the body of Jesus, then any resurrection appearances, uh, we can say that they're most likely, they're most likely just hallucinations. Uh, but in this case, if we have both the empty tomb and the resurrection appearances, it's a totally different story take them together, it means there's a high probability that Jesus actually rose from the dead. And in our scripture today, we are looking at the appearances of Jesus to the disciples. Uh, we are actually looking at two appearances, or two times that he appeared to the disciples. Um, as usual, I will just be going uh, verse by verse. So, as we take a look at our passage today, we can see that the disciples were having a rough time um, after finding out about the empty tomb on Easter Sunday. The Gospel of Luke says that they were gathered together, the eleven of them, uh, at this point Judas is gone, and those with them, and that probably included Mary Magdalene and the disciples who were on the road to Emmaus. Uh, and the Gospel of John says that on the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. Before Jesus came, the disciples were obviously afraid that they might be arrested. And at this point, most likely, since Jesus' body was missing from the tomb, they were really afraid. Because we can imagine the authorities were very upset with the followers of Jesus, thinking that they might have stolen Jesus' body. So they were meeting in fear, in, behind locked doors, until Jesus actually appeared in front of them and spoke the most wonderful words to them at a time like this. Jesus said, Peace be with you. Then he showed them his hands and his side. And then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. So Jesus appeared in his glorious resurrected body. 
And the Gospel of Luke says that the disciples were startled. They were frightened because they thought they saw a spirit. And that's why Jesus showed them his hands and his side to prove to them that this was the same body that had been crucified. Afterwards, Jesus even ate a piece of broiled fish to prove that it's a physical body. The body was real. And so from here, you can see that any other idea that Jesus' body had some sort of interesting divine powers that make him present at many times in many places, um, from here you can see that's probably not the case. Uh, unfortunately, that's exactly what Roman Catholics believe when they think that millions of people eat Jesus' body every day during Catholic Mass. Uh, going to Jesus' greeting, when he said, Peace be with you, uh, that greeting to them is also very important. This traditional Hebrew greeting, it's Shalom, which I'm sure you're also very familiar. It offers the blessing of God's rich peace. Uh, this blessing of peace may have brought relief or given relief to the disciples. Uh, remember that after the crucifixion, the, the disciples, all they did was they ran away. You know, they fled. They fell asleep at Gethsemane. Peter denied him three times, and others have forsaken him. Uh, so if Jesus was thinking from a more fallen human perspective, uh, he could have said, shame on you, disciples. Uh, I'm very angry at you because you left me. You denied me. You fell asleep on me. But Jesus here didn't say those things. Instead, Jesus says, peace. Be with you. After all, it, it would have been too much for Jesus to, or to expect Jesus to be angry with the disciples because at this point in the gospel, none of them have even received the Holy Spirit. After all, it is only through the Holy Spirit that we can understand Jesus, the Bible, and what God is doing. It is only through the Holy Spirit that we are convicted of our sins. It is only through the Holy Spirit that the Bible comes alive when we read it and the Word of God can ring true in our hearts. So after Jesus has taken away their sins because of His death on the cross, He was ready to remove their fears and give them peace. And then He was ready to commission them to proclaim the Gospel, to go out with the Gospel into the world. So Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. So when Christ died for our sins in our place, Jesus provides us or provided us peace with God through the forgiveness of sins. Jesus has received the full punishment that we deserve for violating God's law. The Apostle Paul said that when we are saved by putting our faith in Christ, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. What this means is that God's peace is now in our hearts because we are a forgiven people. And because we have peace in our hearts, we are also filled with supernatural joy. And it is coming from this peace and joy that we are to go out in the world and bring the good news of Christ's peace to His people. So Jesus then sends us into the world to proclaim the gospel and to trust in Jesus. And the next verses show what Jesus does for the disciples and for us before we are sent to proclaim the gospel. The next verses say, and when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. What Jesus gives the disciples in these verses are two things. He gives them power and gives them authority. Jesus gave them power through the Holy Spirit. 
Jesus gave authority to proclaim forgiveness of sins. I will explain it one at a time. Uh, first it says Jesus breathed on them the Holy Spirit. The Greek word for spirit is the same word for breath. And this picture of Jesus breathing on them is a way showing, in a way showing that he is giving them the Holy Spirit. This picture may also remind us of Genesis 2-7 when God breathed his own life into Adam so that he can become the first human being. But when Jesus does it here to the disciples, in a way he is breathing new life into them. They are now new creations. The disciples now have a have this new relationship with God. And for all of us who have been born again through faith in God, in Jesus Christ, we receive the Holy Spirit. And that's important because we need the Spirit so we can have the power to do ministry. We need the Spirit so our proclamation and our actions have the power of God behind them. Uh, you know, here in church, we can do many things. We can do a children's ministry, a worship ministry, prayer ministry. But we need to be aware that the results of what we do here can only happen through the power of the Holy Spirit. And other than giving us the power of the Spirit, Jesus also gives us authority to proclaim the forgiveness of sins. When Jesus says, if you forgive the sins of any, and they are forgiven them, if you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Uh, what Roman Catholics believe is that it gives them a reason to authorize priests to have this special sacrament. They think that this gives priests some special powers to pronounce forgiveness of sins. And that's why, you know, in that specific denomination, they, the priests, they hear confessions, they prescribe penance, they give forgiveness to those who confess the individual priests behind one of those uh, special booths that you may find in Catholic churches if, you, if you've been in one. Um, but as Protestant Christians, we think differently. Uh, the Bible says that God alone has authority to forgive sins. God did not give a special authority to the church and the clergy in the sense that the way Catholics did. What the church receives here is actually the authority of every believer in Christ to proclaim forgiveness of sins through faith in Jesus Christ and in His Gospel. Now, I won't give you the many boring details of why that's the right interpretation. Um, instead, I will just fill you in on what this means for us and for the church. Um, what this passage says is that Jesus has given authority to declare forgiveness through faith in Jesus Christ. And he gave it in such a way that it is based on what God says is the way to salvation. Uh, sins are forgiven not because the church forgives them, but because God offers forgiveness of sins. This authorizes the church to declare Christ's forgiveness whenever we confess our sins here in worship. This authorizes the church to receive new members on the basis of profession of faith in Christ. This authorizes the church to exercise church discipline according to God's word. So all in all, it's not about setting up a special group of people to forgive and retain sins like the way Catholics do in confession, but it is the authority granted to the church to declare Jesus Christ's forgiveness of sins. So a lot of things have taken place here when Jesus made his appearance to the disciples. He showed them his resurrected body. He gave them his peace, which brought about joy. And then he gave them the power of the Holy Spirit and the authority to declare forgiveness of sins. But as we know, not everyone was there during that meeting. And we all know that famous story. It says in verse 24, now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, 
unless I see in his hands the mark on the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails and place my hands into the side, I will never believe. Now there, we don't really know much about Thomas as we know of Peter or John or Paul. But we do know that Thomas gets much bad publicity, uh, you know, because he is called as someone who doubts. Uh, in reality, all the disciples at some point in time uh, failed to believe in Jesus' resurrection, and it's not just Thomas. Uh, and also, to be fair, well, there's actually two kinds of doubts. One kind of doubt is a genuine search for truth. You know, this is someone who may have a sincere question and who desires real answers. It is a, a person who is willing to believe the answer if this is given. Um, in other words, it's, it's some sort of a quest, a real quest for truth. Um, for example, if there's something you may find hard to believe in the Bible and, or find hard to believe about God and you want to know the truth, uh, you first turn to the Bible with an open heart and an open mind. And if you need help in that department and have some more questions, uh, perhaps you should feel free to ask uh, pastors or other Christians. Uh, as long as you're seeking truth and are sincere and open about being persuaded, then God will bless that sooner or later. Um, the problem with Thomas in this story is that he is, in a way, not a seeker of truth. He falls under the second kind of doubt. Uh, Thomas was determined not to believe in the truth. He was already unwilling to believe unless his conditions are met. He was actually not open to hearing any other answer that he already has. He would not be persuaded by the testimony of the disciples whom he knew and loved. Instead, he has this answer. Uh, Jesus, he did not rise from the dead. And Jesus needs to prove it otherwise. He did not have the openness of someone who is seeking what is real and what is true. Um, in a way, he's like people today who have made up their minds about Christianity. You know, they say that Christianity is not true. No matter what you tell them, they're not open to hearing from God's Word or from Jesus. Uh, they're not seeking truth, they are just defending their own positions against Jesus. So what they really want is not the truth, but a debate. So Jesus obliged, not for a debate, but instead he made another appearance for Thomas. Verse 26 says, eight days later, his disciples were inside again and Thomas was with them. And although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands and put your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Uh, one thing we can say about Jesus' body is that it seems like he can appear in the room with the disciples without coming through the locked doors. Um, but in this case, he spoke directly to Thomas and asked him to put his faith in him. Um, it is gracious of Christ to present himself again to Thomas so that he can offer him his peace, uh, peace with God and eternal life. And by showing Thomas his hands, his side, Jesus showed the marks of the sacrifice he made on the cross for our sins. Jesus showed how he laid down his life for our sins and calls us to set aside doubts. So when we have doubts about God, um, it is always good to remember the wounds of Christ. Remember that by his wounds we were healed. We can see that Thomas was brought to faith in Christ Jesus by his second appearance. And Thomas responds not by putting his fingers in the wounds of Jesus' hands and his side. The Bible doesn't actually say that he puts his fingers in Jesus' wounds. Instead, Thomas just said, my Lord and my God. 
This means that he has committed himself to Jesus fully. For some people, it is okay to have Jesus as their Savior, but they do not commit their lives to Jesus. For some people, they want salvation, but not the commitment. They want to go to heaven when they die, but not the commitment to follow Christ while here on earth. But by saying Jesus is Lord, it means Jesus is now who we follow in worship, in obedience, and in our relationship with God. He is not just our Savior. He is our Master. He is the one we follow in every way. So finally, Jesus says in verse 29, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Now, this is where Jesus is telling us a spiritual truth that directly applies to all of us who are believers today. It applies to all of us who have never seen the resurrected Christ, uh, and yet we believe. So the question is, why are we who are believers in Christ blessed? What Jesus is saying is that even if we haven't seen him like the disciples have seen him 2,000 years ago, even if we haven't seen him but still believed in him or put our faith in him, we actually get the same blessing as the disciples. Our sins, they're forgiven. We get the free gift of eternal life. We get to be called children of God. We get to be raised in a glorious body like the resurrected body of Jesus Christ. We get to have the power of the Holy Spirit to lead a holy life. We get to have the peace in our hearts and joy with God. And these blessings we get to have as we proclaim Jesus as Lord and God. So in terms of an application for us, the question is, are we living in the blessing that Jesus brought us, or Jesus brings to us? When we believe and proclaim Jesus as Lord, are we actually walking in the blessing that God has showered on us when we first believe. Um, I have this story about an elevator. I'm, I'm sure you've been in what is called an Otis elevator. You know, you go inside the elevator, you see a, a label that says Otis. Uh, Otis elevators, it's a type of elevator that's in a way a, a standard of industry for the last 150 years. Uh, there was this man, his name was Elisha Otis. Um, he wasn't the inventor of the elevator, but what he actually invented was the braking system from inside so that the elevator won't make a free fall while you're inside. You know, you're somewhere up in the middle of 1st and 64th floor. Uh, before Otis, uh, most of the elevators uh, were more like open platforms that come apart and then people get seriously injured when, you know, the cables break and, and the platform falls. And without a good braking system, elevators were only made for buildings limited for up to just six floors, six stories high. Uh, when Otis made the braking system, it made it possible for elevators to go up into the sky. Um, the available floors in the building become, became more like sky's the limit. Uh, nowadays, I have no idea how many floors, um, they're the tallest building, uh, how many floors it has. Uh, at first, Elisha Otis actually had trouble selling his elevators with this new braking system. Um, but in 1854, he made this sales demonstration at the Crystal Palace exhibition in Manhattan. Um, every hour at this exposition, Otis stepped into the elevator. He gave the order to an assistant who cut the rope. You know, and so the crowd, they were, they were holding their breath, and they're like, ah, wondering what's going to happen. And then the brakes, it of course, kicked in. The elevator stopped, and then Otis announced, all is safe, gentlemen. You know, all, is, all is safe. Uh, so with that demonstration, Otis sold his first three elevators for just $300 each. 
And today, New York City has more than 70,000 elevators. Um, that's there today, probably cost more than 300 bucks a piece, of course. Uh, the, but the interesting part of this story is that no one bought the elevator. I mean, he was having a hard time selling the elevator until they saw the demonstration. No one believed in what Otis is saying unless they saw the demonstration with him on the elevator with the rope being cut and with the elevator not falling and holding. Instead, they saw that the elevator can keep you safe. The question for us today, I think, is how much, how much more of a demonstration do we need from God? How much more of a demonstration do we need from God who sent His Son, Jesus, to die on the cross for us? How much more of a demonstration do we need from Christ who resurrected from the dead? Because in the resurrection, we have the greatest demonstration that God can ever give. In the resurrection, we know that we are blessed to continue to have faith and trust in Christ. In the resurrection, we know that our sins are forgiven and we get the free gift of eternal life. We get to be called children of God. We get to be raised in a glorious body like the body of Jesus. We get to have the power of the Holy Spirit to lead a holy life. We get to have peace in our hearts and joy with God. My point is, as we keep on moving forward here in this Easter season, maybe we reminded of the blessings and the power that we actually have as children of the living God. The God who sent His Son Jesus on the cross. The God who brought Him back to dead, from the dead by His resurrection. May we actually live and walk in the blessing of the Lord as we commit to Him more fully walk in His ways, and remain pure in our hearts and minds. Let us pray.